Can you guys see this uh, okay? Yes. All right, perfect. So thank you very much for uh, organizing this meeting. Uh, I really appreciate the, all the stuff that I've been learning already and I'm sure it will continue in this way. And um, it's a, a great pleasure and a privilege to be able to um, contribute, hopefully something useful uh, to it as well. So um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the work we do on parahydrogen induced polarization in the context of microfluidic lab on a chip devices. And to set the stage, uh, in this audience, I, I'd like to uh, show you a couple of examples of uh, microfluidic devices that have nothing to do with NMR. Actually, um, microfluidics is a <clears throat> fairly mature and uh, rather big field of, uh, of uh, interdisciplinary science. And um, using NMR for detection in this field is, uh, is rather the odd one out. Typically, things are looked at by fluorescent techniques um, because they're more sensitive. Um, here is an example of a gut on a chip and what the uh, colleagues here at um, um, UNC, uh, Nancy Albritton's uh, group there have been doing is they built these structures um, here. Uh, we essentially just microfabricated holes and they seed them with um, the right kind of stem cells under the right conditions. And these stem cells then develop into structures that are very similar to um, the microvilli that uh, make up the functional units of uh, the gut. So essentially they're using structure which is generated by microfabrication together with uh, biology to induce a process of self-organization. And they can of course modify the structure and then study this process in, in great detail. So it's the control over the conditions that is being used here. Okay, having issues switching forward. What's going on here? Can you guys still hear me? We, we can hear you. Oh, there goes your slide. Here we go. Um, so here is another example of a microfluidic device. This one actually has active valves on it. Uh, this is from um, Savas Taze Group at ETH in Basel. Um, here, these green bars uh, that you can see here, these are the actual sample chambers. They're filled with liquid. And the two valves here at the top and the bottom are these little red, uh, red streaks here. They are in a different layer above the, uh, the, the uh, microfluidic layer. Um, and in each of these green uh, chambers, a concentration gradient can be built up and they've been using this to study the response of cells to concentration gradients in um, the in um, inflammatory agents. Really struggling here with moving my slides forward. Why is this not working? Sorry about that. Okay, so in a typical microfluidic study, um, you get um, detailed environmental control over what you're looking at, and you get out information at the level of the individual cell, <clears throat> typically by fluorescence. That's a very highly specific observation. You're looking at one aspect of the cellular metabolism that is picked up by whatever fluorescent probe you're, you're using. And it's at best semi-quantitative. It's usually not, uh, you know, you don't get millimolar or nanomolar information. You'd get information of a bit more or a bit less. Contrast that with NMR, as we all know, NMR doesn't need advertising uh, in this crowd. Um, but NMR gives you system level information. If you look at the metabolites in a living system, you see essentially all of them. Um, it gives you quantitative information if you do it right, and you can do it non-invasively, so you don't have to kill the system in order to, uh, or poison it with some fluorescent tag in order to get information out. And so what we're trying to do is combine the advantages of NMR with the promise of microfluidic systems in order to study uh, things like uh, 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 systems shown here, for example, uh, tissue slices, but also self-organized groups of cells, spheroids, or 
uh, just adherent cell cultures. Now, NMR, of course, has been uh, done at small scale before. So micro fluidic NMR combination of micro fabrication and NMR spectroscopy uh, goes back at least two decades or probably even more. Uh, here are some early examples from uh, Radovan Popovich's group at EPFL and um, they microfabricated lithographically these uh, detectors. Uh, here these planar detectors combined them with microfluidic sample chambers made in glass and got these spectra which are um, uh, rather uh, disappointing in terms of resolution. Sensitivity is quite okay, but resolution is not so great. Um, and that had to do with poor management of uh, susceptibility artifacts. Um, we have taken a slightly different approach from these planar spiral coils um, that was inspired by uh, very impressive work done by Arno Kenkins uh, uh, a decade ago, where they showed that with uh, strip lines, one can pick up NMR signals uh, with very high sensitivity. And this is a geometry that scales very well. It's easy to, to fabricate it in a way that doesn't mess up the uh, magnetic field homogeneity. So uh, we've slightly varied uh, Arno Kenkins strip line by essentially using a pair of planar uh, conductors with a constriction here in the middle. And you can think of such a detector very simply as a combination of two plate capacitors. And the eigenmode that we're using for spectroscopy is the one where one of these capacitors discharges uh, the other and vice versa. And that leads to a magnetic uh, B1 field that's perpendicular here in the middle. If you place the sample there, you get a signal with good resolution and good sensitivity. Um, so here is a, a cartoon of what such a system looks like. You have a microfluidic device that has the sample chamber that lines up with the constriction here in this probe. Uh, we've built these probes and uh, optimized their, their sensitivity by finite elements um, and had quite a bit of success uh, with that. So for example, we can look at uh, cell cultures, uh, comparing here adherent cell cultures to the same type of cells grown in uh, a spheroid where we've done that by coating the inside of the chip with a substance that makes it difficult for the cells to adhere to the, to the chip surface. So they have to adhere to each other. We can then measure the metabolism of these cells using NMR over a period of say 48 hours quantitatively. So we get detailed information over how much glucose is consumed, how rapidly, how much lactic acid is produced, and uh, many other metabolites uh, in these cells. And of course, we can, uh, we can count the cells visually, so we're not killing them, they stay alive. As we verify by a live dead stain, so this is after the experiment, uh, in the top row you see the adherent cells, in the bottom row uh, the spheroids, green cells are alive, and the uh, purple ones are the ones that have died. So uh, this is, take this as good news because most of these cells here are still uh, quite viable after 48 hours in, in this microfluidic device. And we can get quantitative information on various metabolites, uh, for example, as I already mentioned, glucose and uh, lactic acid, but also others, uh, alanine, uh, glutamine, uh, and so on. Uh, you can see from the error bars here that we can work with kind of millimolar concentrations. I forgot to mention the sample chamber in these chips is about two and a half microliters, so about 100 times smaller than a conventional NMR uh, sample tube. I really don't know why this is happening. Apologize for it. There we go. So um, since the uh, metabol metabolite concentrations are linear functions in time, we can then extract metabolic rates and we can com com compare quantitatively the spheroids and the monolayer cells. Um, on a per cell basis, we find that the spheroids are um, uh, much slower in their, met uh, in their metabolism. Uh, you see that when we change the scale here by a factor of five, then um, the, the graphs look quite similar. Uh, there are also some subtle differences. For example, the spheroids don't really produce any alanine, 
whereas the, uh, the monolayers do. So the cells actually behave qualitatively differently in these two uh, modalities. Another system we're interested in are uh, these liver slices here. So we cut, um, we first take a mouse liver, then we cut the core out of it here, which is then microtomed into 200 micron thin sections, which can then also be cultural in a microfluidic device. This is a more of a technical challenge because now you have to provide not only the nutrients, but you have to provide oxygen. You have to keep these uh, tissues carefully at 37 Celsius. But that can all be integrated into a narrowbore NMR system, uh, as you see down here, and we get similar information um, to the, the, the uh, cell cultures that I've shown you before, but now at the tissue level. So why am I telling you all this? Because our interest of, in hyperpolarization obviously stems from the limitations in sensitivity that we have to live with in such systems. And it would be nice if we could get metabolites that are hyperpolarized and if we could produce them directly onto the same microfluidic chip and integrate all the complexity necessary for that uh, into the same microfluidic device. And that would, of course, be uh, uh, really, really helpful. So uh, the, the, the inspiration here is the sidearm hydrogenation principle, which has been demonstrated by um, Sylvia Imis group uh, a few years ago. And um, in view of that, we have um, built, here we go, sorry. This microfluidic device here, where again, we have a two and a half microliter sample chamber here in the middle. But now we flow a mixture of uh, a solution of a, uh, the FIP precursor and the catalyst in methanol in through uh, this channel here. And uh, we provide hydrogen gas in a parallel channel here. And the hydrogen gas then diffuses through a PDMS uh, silicone membrane into the liquid channel where it reacts and where it then uh, produces the uh, parahydrogen signal after uh, reacting with the precursor to produce uh, the, uh, the, the double bond molecule, um, allyl acetate. Um, we can, there are various advantages of doing the experiment this way over uh, in a, a shake and drop manner. One of them is that you can just vary the flow rate if you want to study kinetics. Um, so we've done that as well. Um, what we can also do is we can um, do uh, saturation recovery experiments. So in order to study the kinetics, so here we uh, use a train of pi pulses to uh, saturate the signal, and then we study how the signal builds back up as a function of time. Um, we see a very sharp, relatively sharp peak in the signal intensity as a function of flow rate. And um, Sylvia in her talk uh, tomorrow will tell you a, a, a lot more about that uh, in more detail. She's done a, a lot of quantitative analysis of this process uh, by finite elements uh, to understand why this maximum appears at this flow rate and why it is, this, uh, it, it, it is so narrow. Particularly what we didn't understand at the beginning is as you increase the flow rate, why does it drop off so quickly? We would have expected a much more gradual uh, fall of this. But I don't want to steal Sylvia's thunder. She'll tell you more about that tomorrow. Um, so I'll skip over the finite element si simulations here. Um, and I'd just like to show you the, the improvement in sensitivity that we get. So um, this is a plot uh, which we'll take a closer look at uh, again in a moment. But basically it shows the sensitivity, the mass limit of detection of various NMR detectors as a function of their size in terms of the, the volume that's being looked at. And uh, you see here, this is the thermal polarization result with our transmission line probe, uh, which I showed you earlier, which is at about this volume here that corresponds to two and a half microliters. And uh, we can see concentrations which are about millimolar, which are on this diagonal here in this diagram. And now if you hyperpolarize the sample, your sensitivity, of course, improves 
by a few orders of magnitude, uh, maximum of five, and you end up down here. So um, another advantage of doing this in continuous flow is that you can do very conventional 2D NMR spectra, just take different T1 increments, and uh, you don't see too much T1 noise. Uh, so again, more details on the, uh, the quantitative aspects of this uh, on Tuesday uh, by Silvia. In the remaining few minutes that I have, I'd like to um, examine a different question. In a way, of course, we all know sensitivity is uh, a bit like the Achilles heel of NMR. And one of the reasons why sensitivity is such an issue for us is uh, of course, the, the low inherent thermal polarization. So hyperpolarization to an extent fixes that. The question then is, what's the next stumbling block? And um, if we stick with inductive detection, uh, then for us it's particularly interesting in the context of microfluidics, how the sensitivity of such detector scales with size. For example, could we do a metabolism experiment like I've shown you on cells and tissue slices on a single cell? Is that feasible? Or could we even do it on a single protein molecule? What are the theoretical limitations here? So the sensitivity of the NMR experiment has been uh, looked at and an authoritative paper written by David Hult and um, Holton Richards in 1976, so 50 years ago, this uh, question has been settled and um, Richards introduced uh, this quantity here. This is their expression for the signal to noise ratio. And it all hinges on this B1 of XY here. This quantity is the B1 field amplitude generated by a unit current in the coil. And uh, they do this, they arrive at this result by uh, looking at the e electromotive force uh, that is induced by Faraday's law in, uh, in the turns of the coil like this and compare it to the Johnson noise. Now, of course, this works very well and produces very reliable predictions if your coil geometry looks like something uh, like this, where you can identify the actual coil and you can, the, the notion of a current uh, makes, makes sense. But in many detectors, it doesn't. Uh, for example, think of a birdcage coil. What's the current in that coil? The current is different in each of the, uh, of the mesh nodes. Or uh, another problem is scaling. The current distribution in such a structure doesn't just simply scale if you uh, scale it up or down. So actually, this isn't the ideal geometry to examine the physical limits of, uh, of scaling in, um, in NMR detection. Instead, take a look at, uh, at this here. So in 2009, a very nice paper came out uh, of the MRI group uh, in Zurich, Klaus Prismann's group, where they looked at traveling wave NMR. So instead of an inductive coil, they used an antenna uh, which creates a circularly polarized uh, electromagnetic wave that travels through the bore of the MRI scanner. And it can travel because the cutoff frequency of that waveguide with its large diameter is low enough to accommodate the NMR signal. Um, and you can get real MR images with this trick. And uh, a couple of years later, Alexei Yersho and his group showed that you don't actually need um, to, to deal with a cutoff frequency, you can just string a transmission line, just a 50 ohm cable, uh, coaxial cable through the bore of an NMR magnet and replace some of the dielectric in that transmission line with a, uh, a sample and you can get an NMR signal from the traveling wave in that transmission line. And th that geometry actually turns out to be a very useful one to think about in terms of NMR sensitivity. So we're going to simplify it uh, a little more. Take two surfaces, conducting surfaces, top and bottom, and in between uh, we have a planar transmission line, very much like the detector geometry that I showed you earlier that we use. 
And of course, it's well known that uh, Maxwell's equations apply here. And um, with the boundary conditions given in this structure, you end up with electric field lines that go from one surface to the other. So they're parallel to the z-axis here. And the magnetic field line go into the page or out of the page, so in the y direction, uh, parallel to the, uh, to the metallic boundaries. One has to take into account the constitutive laws here that relate the uh, magnetic induction to the magnetic field and the electric displacement to the electric field. And one can then eliminate the magnetic or the electric field to end up with a wave equation that describes the wave modes that travel in this system. Now, if we put a sample here in the middle that is, contains nuclear spins, so that represents a certain magnetization. And that magnetization can undergo Larmor precession if an external static magnetic field is present. Then that introduces a source term into this wave equation. And uh, one can solve this uh, very easily. And one ends up with a situation where two electromagnetic waves travel away in this system from the sample. It's very easy to calculate what the magnitude or the amplitude of these waves is. They're both proportional, the electric field and the magnetic field uh, of the, to the magnetization of the sample. And uh, for reasonable sizes of the sample, small compared to the wavelength of the, uh, of the propagating field, then they're also proportional to the length of this transmission line that you have filled with sample. And from that, we can calculate the power that is coupled out of the spin system into these uh, transmission lines. And we can then compare that power um, to, a, um, to the noise that's go that, that happens here. I have a little animation here, which wouldn't play. Uh, other. So let me show it to you here. I hope you can see that. So here is the... Uh, sample region here in the middle between plus and minus uh, the, the first uh, stop here plus and minus 0.5 on the, in this scale and you see the traveling magnetic uh, field the uh, electromagnetic waves that are moving away from the sample yeah okay now the other thing we need to take into account is the noise and the noise uh, power is related to the uh, amount of attenuation that that uh, uh, transmission line causes to an incoming noise field. It has to compensate, it essentially has to emanate enough noise uh, power to compensate for the amount of power it absorbs from the, uh, from the noise field in the system. So we can also calculate the noise from very simple first principles that's generated by uh, this bit of sample. And so that little bit here in the middle, this bit where uh, we have a, a sample inside of the uh, transmission line, that's our detector. And we now have to compare the signal it generates, signal power it generates, to the noise power it generates. We come up with a very simple expression that contains essentially only known quantities. Now we can require that that signal to noise ratio is larger than a certain limit and it's customary to assume that you need about a factor of 10 in signal power to noise power at the limit of detection. If you take nine, then it's easy to take the square root. Um, one can then put in the magnetic moment in terms of the spin density, the polarization and uh, the magnetogyric ratio gamma. And finally, you end up with a scaling law for the concentration limit of detection, which goes like, uh, like the inverse two thirds power of the volume. And you also get scaling laws with polarization. Obviously, the higher the polarization, the lower the concentration you need, uh, the B naught field and gamma here. If you use thermal polarization, then of course alpha is dependent on B naught as well, and that increases the, uh, the power here. And by the way, this very large uh, power of 7 fourth is one of the reasons why we will not easily catch up with EPR insensitivity anytime soon. So how does this play out um, in macro 
terms, you end up predicting about one micromolar or two micromolar concentration limit of detection at thermal polarization. And of course, if you hyperpolarize completely, then that goes down by a corresponding factor of about five orders of magnitude, as is well known. In our 2.5 microliter devices, we need a bit more. We need about 36 uh, micromolar concentrations uh, by this prediction. And for a single cell, we would need 90 millimolar, uh, which clearly isn't going to happen biologically. Uh, biology happens at lower concentrations. But if we can hyperpolarize, then single cell NMR is actually plausible. And that's a quite tantalizing prospect. Even in the extreme, so here, let's assume we can microfabricate a 100 nanometer structure in 3D. Um, that is then hopeless uh, for thermal polarization. It would have to be 5,000 molar uh, in protons. Uh, that, that's, I don't know of a substance that um, has that high spin density. But if you hyperpolarize it again, then one could potentially see by inductive detection the NMR signal from such a small, uh, such a small sample. So I'm out of time and I don't want to test your patience. So I'm uh, not going to uh, tell you too much more about this figure here, but I hope that uh, you, you found this uh, discussion of, of sensitivity and scaling uh, interesting. I should add that of course the calculation which corresponds to this line here is an extreme good weather scenario because you really only take into account the absolute minimum system and all the uh, impedance matching and tuning and amplification and so on steps that are also necessary will of course only ever degrade the signal and not enhance it or the signal to noise. So with that um, I'd like to uh, thank my research group for all the hard work that they've put into uh, what I've been presenting you. Um, I'd also like to thank Malcolm Levitt and his group for uh, a very nice collaboration on this FIP on a chip project and on other things. And uh, various uh, good people have contributed funds for, uh, for our research. And last but not least, I'd really like to thank you for your uh, kind attention. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, amazing talk. Um, one question about the slide that you've just shown. How does the spectral resolution is taken into account with the limits of detection that you've shown? So the spectral, so um, in, it's actually, if you look at the units here, then um, you see that it's, uh, you can also th look at this as nanomole over square root of hertz. Um, I, I like to present it as nanomole square root second, as a really matter of taste. So what this essentially says is how many spins you need that have to resonate within one hertz in order to, uh, to be detectable above the noise. Now, of course, if you somehow manage to take your available spins and shim them down into a sharper line, then of course that line will correspondingly rise higher above the, uh, above the noise. So there is a direct correspondence there between signal and noise. And that's one of the reasons why um, the race with EPR isn't entirely hopeless. Okay. And one question more towards the applications of this. And all other questions I'll have to defer to the uh, Slack. Um, if you do your sidearm hydrogenation with FIP, could you hypothetically then say, redissolve that? So... Um, redissolve it? Like mean, do a hydrolysis and then do a phase separation, for example, so that you get rid of all that? Yes, of course. That's um, now we're, we're we're firmly we're firmly transitioning from um, you know science fact to science fiction, but that's of course a, a, a an, an obvious prospect, and we're working on that. Um, the the ultimate idea would be to have all of this integrated into a nice single lab on a chip system where you know essentially you have a cell culture or a tissue culture integrated and the only source of polarization would be power hydrogen gas that is supplied to the system. Uh, we'll, we'll see how far we get with that. That's uh, of course we work, we work towards that and there's many steps that have to be solved uh, in order to make that practical. 
Yeah, thank you so much. That sounds like a great vision and with